Hello and welcome back to the Faulty Projector podcast, where we talk all matters film because all film matters. My name is Dennis Shutters Tizard, and I'm joined as ever by Robert Beams. Rob, how are you doing? Hello, I'm very good, Dennis. How are you? And more importantly, how's the weather? <laughs> it's a beautiful day here. Beautiful day here in Galicia. Uh, beautiful question, as always. How about there? How are you? How are you getting? Oh, on? it's a oh, it's a glorious day here. Glorious day here in Barcelona. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Rob, tell me, god damn it, what have you seen in the last two weeks? Tell me about we your Fortnite film. Doing, <laughs> have we done Fortnite film? Okay. Uh Fortnite film. I'm I actually I, I probably said this the last three or four episodes we've done. I've gone from never watching anything and never having anything to talk about to I'm just chaining films all the time at the moment. I think like the in order to not just be too scattered, um, I'll just say that my main thing at the minute is that um, I'm getting obsessed with trying to complete lists that are on Letterboxd, right? Is one of your lists to watch every Japanese movie ever? (laughs) (laughs) That's another list I've made. Uh, That's a a tangent. Basically, like, um, that's a real tangent, but I'll go very quick into it. Basically, uh, I made a list. I've had the Criterion channel for a while, as I've talked about before, and I've had this kind of guilty, nagging thing the whole time I've had it, where I'm really into Kurosawa, I really like Ozu, but I was aware that there were a lot of other directors contemporaneous to them in Japan who I didn't really know anything about. And I didn't feel like, I felt like I wanted more of that context and to really know what else was going on at the time in in Japan, which I guess is just context. I just said that twice. Uh, But like, uh, and so so I made this list of um, the other kind of canon directors. So Mizuguchi, Naruse, Kobayashi, a few others. Uh, And I've been going through trying to clear uh, on Letterboxd again, because it always comes back to Letterboxd. If you just look at a director on Letterboxd, look at their films, It all the all, the default view is popularity, which is, I guess, just which the most common ones people blog are. So I've sort of been going through trying to clear the first few rows for all these directors. So that's one list I'm sort of like been working on, and I've completed a big portion of that. But the other list I'm currently working on, it's why I was watching uh, before recording this, I watched the uh, Carl Theodore Dreher film, Audet from the 50s, a Danish um, religious drama, um, is because, uh, have you ever sh- heard of um, They Shoot Pictures, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, They Shoot Pictures, don't they, compiles this top 1,000 films list every year that they source, as far as I'm aware, based on assigning points, weighting them for these different um, industry lists, like mm. um, Sight and Sound, Kaya de Cinema, Kinema Junpo, uh, all these all these different lists around the world of the kind of Sight and Sound, Kaya de Cinema sort of level. And the films get points based on where they're placed in these lists. And then they use that to collate a top 1,000 list overall. That's going to um, be interesting for it. our conversation later yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. And they, they, they update this, uh, I think, every year based on the polls that come in. Um, and uh, on Letterboxd, it's very helpful, actually, if you search lists, you can generally find people have already uploaded all of these kind of lists. So the the shoot pictures, don't they? The sight and sound lists, all of them end up on there. So I'm trying to go through the 1,000, the, the, the canonical 1,000 greatest films of all time as voted for by knobs list you know like yeah, the real yeah, the yeah, real yeah. one uh and i'm i was started off at like i know 38 percent through it and i've managed to mm-hmm. get up to like 42 42 percent on it i'm trying to i'm going to try and reach 50 percent by the by the end of this year on it but it's um <laughs> we'll put that on your tombstone I'm, yeah exactly that i've done it <laughs> but that's that's what i'm watching at the minute so i'm going through that cool. and and it's this um it's this kind of interesting thing isn't it that we'll be obviously aware of from like studying film and all that but like um canon formation within film is kind of problematic in the sense that most of the established canon has been established from like a very small group of french dudes in the 50s who basically just picked a load of films that they liked and decide what decided what made a good film like that then and so like you go through this top one you know the first 100 of this thousand list and i'm watching so many I feel like such an arsehole saying this. I know there are going to be people like, this clearly destroys your credibility. But I feel like you get like great film, great film, great film, kind of average French film, great film, great film, great film, (laughs) kind of average French film. Like like there are are so many that are in there, like really high up. And you're just like, like, this was clearly just a favorite film of Truffaut and Godard and Bazin yeah, or whatever. They, they, they the love cinema. this. Like, yeah. And, and so like, like for example, I don't Have you seen the rules of the game? Yeah. Right. I wait, watched the rules wait, of the game. Wait, no, wait, wait. That. Is that the one that's like meant to be realist for its time? 
and um, it has the the slow like uh, dolly shots, and it's like set in a mansion, and they're just there having a weekend yeah, away, and they one. do some hunting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I liked it. Yeah, yeah, I thought it's fine, but I watched yeah. it, and it's one of those films where I watched it going. This is consistently in the top ten greatest films of all time, yeah. and you yeah. can tell. Like you watch, you know, you watch Citizen Kane, or you watch Vertigo, or you watch any of these things, and you can kind of see why. And mm -hmm. then you'll watch, like, for me anyway, and I know I'm being an idiot here, and there are probably people who have a million reasons why, but I watch that, or I watch um, La Talante. I don't know if you've seen that one. That's another one no. in the top ten. It's about, like, some people on a little barge going along on a French river. And I'm watching these films just going, like, yeah, I guess Goddard really liked this one, <laughs> and that's why it's here. <laughs> you know, and, and um, anyway, without wanting to make myself, to take myself further into disrepute, um it is it is interesting and, and you do run into that kind of problematic thing with kind of canon formation and so it's like i'm taking obviously the list with a pinch of salt you know because yeah. it comes from this place but i i also do kind of there's that part of me that feels i would like to have seen all those films well i was gonna I say like yeah. i don't want to speak for you but at the end of the day the reason we do those kind of lists and challenges is because there's lots of films we feel like we should watch or we have interest mm. in but we just never get around to so if you yeah. can you know commit yourself to these lists then you've watched them yeah, exactly. and hopefully, obviously, as a byproduct, you've watched lots of good films that have enriched your life. Yeah, exactly, and I think like exactly, and like that has happened as well. Like um, going through this list already, uh, I finally got round. I've never seen a John Cassavetes, and I watched uh, Woman Under the Influence the other day, mm. and that was crazy good. Have you seen it? No, it's been on my list for a long it's, time. It's bro. really good. Gina Rowlands in that film is it's one of the best screen performances I think I've ever seen in anything. So obviously, you come across in that top. 1000 there's going to be loads of things you love as well but yeah. I, I think it's um it's i don't know dangerous is probably too strong a word but there's definitely a part of you going through a list like that where you're inclined to want to like everything because you're just like i know these are all like quote unquote great so when yeah. it comes to kind of scoring it on letterbox which is an arbitrary thing anyway that i really only do for my own ordering like when i search um i kind of find myself going you know what? I really hated that, but I can't give it less than three, can I? It's great. It's a great <laughs> film. It's capital G. Don't, great. Be an, don't, don't be an idiot, Rob. It's great. Uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, that's what I've been up to. What have you been up to? What have you been watching? I saw. I saw actually on your letterbox, you've um, you've watched rather more kind of uh, Spanish film than me, and I don't mean like Brunel Almodovar. I mean like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mainstream like the, Spanish cinema. Yeah, yeah. I feel, yeah well, I, I like actually, the... two of those films to clear to clear up the record. Two of those films are ones that I'd. And this actually proves your point perfectly. Two of those films I'd watched years ago but forgotten about and then when i went to log like one or two that i'd seen recently i was like oh shit yeah i've seen that as well better up my you know film scene viewed <laughs> count on letterbox um but yeah it's i don't want to be too condescending but there's just yeah mainstream comedies in spain don't get it really really don't get it this is very alien to me i mean we do want to talk about comedies at some point in the future so i won't say too much um but i just yeah whenever it comes to like very broad um things with sharp tonal whiplash that uh, a lot of Spanish commas, especially comedies tend to have. I just, I don't get it. <laughs> Do you get it? Because, because as you, as you mentioned, we're going to talk about comedies in an upcoming podcast, specifically us kind of not getting a lot of it. Uh, but like, uh, do you not get it to the same or to a worse degree than you do with like not getting some shit American comedy? Like, what's the? Oh, are they are worse. they worse? They're worse. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know because there's different ways to be worse. No, like I mm. find that um, the worst of the worst American ones tend to be more offensive, and that might sound strange because often oh, I'm in dodgy territory here, aren't I? Sometimes, <laughs> no, I'm not even going to go there. Sp um, Spanish Spanish humor can tend towards racism and sexism much yes. more readily at an acceptable level. You know, yeah, exactly. like, like, you know, they still have like the Chiringuitos with the blacked up person on the suites. Mm. And, you know, I went to yeah. Valencia once and there were loads of kids just blacked up in a parade. So the thing is, is when the culture is is kind of still at a place where that's fine. And then you come from a place where that's not fine. The comedy is very likely to go places. Yeah, that you'll, yeah, exactly. But conversely, like I say, American comedies at their worst, like I'm thinking like the Farley brothers, brothers and things, mm. they're more insulting and horrible than a lot of um, Spanish comedies. So it depends how you mean bad, but uh, yeah. sometimes cultural things that I don't get, or I miss a line or two because of the language, I tend to watch them in the original language with Spanish subtitles. 
sometimes with English subtitles, depending on how lazy I'm feeling that particular day. Um, but yeah, I don't know. They what, were what, you, what were you going to say for Fortnightly Film before I made you talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> loads of things because we uh, we watched lots of like serious um you know oscar movies in the lead up to our previous podcast and it's just that time of year um and i do love those kind of movies um but they tend to be not particularly exciting to talk about for fortnightly film i say oh rob i watched this really good film it has great cinematography and the acting is great and it's a good story <laughs> you should watch it so should you uh, listeners but you know there's not much more to say but this time we watched a load of stuff ranging from bad to awful um, and one classic that I've been meaning to watch for years, which I haven't seen. So I'm just going to give you a couple of them. First one I want to talk about is Chaos Walking. Have you seen it? I haven't. I've heard fr- mixed things because I've heard that it's awful, but I've also heard it's not as awful as people are saying. It's it's not. It's, I'm really frustrated about this and I want to get my piece out about this. So Chaos Walking, is it like a capital G good movie or even a great one? No, it's not. Is it awful? No. It's just not like people seem obsessed with like dragging this film down and make it the new film to tear apart on YouTube and, you know, Reddit, whatever. It's just not that bad. I think a lot of people, do you know the main setup of the movie? No, no. So without spoiling anything to say that the basic plot setup is we've got um, uh, pioneers in the future going through space, trying to find like Earth 2 um, and they get to a planet um, and on this planet, all of a sudden, uh, all the men's thoughts are both um, audible to the women and also the other men around them, but also represented physically to some extent uh, around their heads and around their bodies, right? But all the women, fine. No one can hear their their voices, right? So obviously this creates a lot of problems, blah, blah, blah. That kind of sets up the, the movie. A lot of people seem to hate this concept, right? And the way it's visualized physically around their people's mm. heads. I don't know. I think it's really cool. It's really interesting. And in fact, I think that's why, for for example, that Charlie Kaufman originally took a crack at the script, um, which he has done from time to time, hasn't he, on, on bigger budget movies. Mm. But then he's not even credited anymore. So I don't know how much of his original writing is there. But I can see why he'd be interested in that. Right? Like yeah. male psyche externalized for all the world to mm. see. And it's kind of awkward, messy, embarrassing glory. Um, and yeah, of course, there are some like um, misfires and odd moments and you can tell they're kind of building a bigger world that they don't fully explore. And there are some s- cheesy, shitty kind of YA trappings because it is based on a YA series of novels. Um, is it clearly gunning for a series? Is it clearly gunning yeah, for yeah, part yeah. one? Yeah. And the ending is, the ending in particular is bad, like pretty awful. Um, but... It's got an interesting idea. It's an interesting world. You've got two very likable leads, depending on your opinion of um, Tom Holland and uh, Daisy Ridley. I enjoyed them quite a lot. Um, And yeah, it's all right. You know, like you can stick it on on a rainy Sunday and go, oh, that was a bit different and weird. Didn't fully work, but it was all right. But people are eviscerating this thing. And I was just like, yeah, there's a a tendency. We're probably going to talk about it in our main topic because we're talking today about sort of stuff adjacent to this there is definitely part of internet fandom and the kind of way people talk about films where commercial failure gets bound up very readily with artistic failure and that's not a modern phenomenon like that goes right back like you look at like books about the biggest turkeys of all time and they'll talk about like my granddad had some old book that was about the greatest hollywood turkeys and it'd have all the ones you'd ever heard about like ishtar and um, yeah. all these kind of things uh, and lots of those films end up getting reevaluated further down the line because people go Oh, actually, people talked about this like it was terrible because it was a huge flop and it lost loads mm. of money. But actually, it was fine or good as an actual yeah. film. I think yeah. we're quite, quite, um, when you see the narrative in the press, I don't know, the postman or Waterworld has like lost all this money, it becomes very easy to then go, well, that thing must therefore just be visibly bad. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well, it's that thing of like, build up a hero to then tear them down. No, we love to have this big, mm. exciting, glamorous Hollywood machine. And then when it does bad or lets us down, we love to, you know, send in the wolves. Um, but it's just all right, guys. Like, if you're intrigued by the concept, watch it, because it has some interesting things to say and not always well done, but <laughs> it's a cool idea. Um, it's, it was obviously really poorly marketed. I guess one of the issues with it was them not really knowing how to market it, because until yeah. you said what it was about, I didn't know that it was sci-fi. I didn't know that it wow. took place on other planets. I didn't yeah, know that yeah, it yeah. had any of this stuff to do with hearing people's thoughts and seeing the materials, because all of the pictures just look like, I don't know, I, I just, I'm seeing pictures of like Tom Holland in 
the jungle. I just yeah. assumed they went out walking somewhere and it was quite chaotic. <laughs> like I had absolutely no idea about any of this. Like, oh, there might be I a think... tiger. <laughs> Another reason why um, people have jumped on it a bit as well, because it is very famously had a lot of reshoots and it's been, mm. it was in development hell for a while, went through different directors' hands, um, was delayed several times from its original release date. And I think people love to also jump on those kind of details and mm. say, see, see, it was doomed from the beginning. And it's like, yes, but that happens a lot with a lot of movies and you mm. never even hear about it. So yes, it can be an indicator this movie might not be great, but it doesn't, mean it's like definitive proof that it's bad and speaking of definitive proof that something's bad for maybe silly reasons we'll definitely touch on that again later <laughs> I believe. Yes. um just two other things i want to talk about briefly uh <laughs> weird ones we um sat down on i think it was a wednesday and a thursday on the wednesday we watched you've got mail and on the first day we watched my best friend's wedding so we went full-on 90s rom-com uh double bill have you seen either uh, I grew up in a house where you've got males in pretty steady rotation, so I have a kind of nice. uh, I have a kind of Stockholm syndrome fondness for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, like I'd never seen it, and I'm, I'm way past that, like you know, edgy teenager, early twenties phase of like it's a rom com, therefore, bleh. Um, you know, it's a movie, could be interesting, could be engaging, could have charming leads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Going with an open mind, and the thing is, it is it's kind of bad, but it's also very charming. Like I said, like Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks does not to me scream like sex or romance for a single second. He's either <laughs> a child or your dad, right? Like <laughs> I don't, I don't get it how he was ever sold as a romantic lead, but, but he's very engaging to watch on screen. The camera loves mm. him. Um, and Meg Ryan in that movie, poof, a bit difficult to sit through. She's a bit of a like a proto manic pixie dream girl, just kind of like jumping through the scenes like a child, um, high on sugar or something. And then obviously the whole story and everything is just really ugly, really ugly. It sets us up with mm. some sort of David versus Goliath thing, and then the end says, "But actually, maybe you should just lick the boots of the oppressor and fall in love with them." On top of that, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and then you, uh, uh, have you ever seen The Shop Around the Corner? Uh, it's a no, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a technical remake of that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah like the weird the... begin. There's a weird thing that says based on the screenplay for the shop right, around yeah. the corner. Okay. And I was yeah, like, what's that all about? Because that's that's like I've actually not seen it. It's one of my dad's favorite films. It's supposed to be great. It's Ernst Lubitsch comedy, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, and then obviously there's that really, really, really strange reveal of um, she has like an older colleague that she works with or an employee at the the, the bookshop, and then <laughs> they're like she, all throughout the film she's talking about this like long lost love she had, and everyone's like goading all the time like who was it? Come on, tell us who it was. And then one point like around the end of Act Two, she, she they sit down at her house for tea or something, whatever people do, and uh, she they she says who it is. Do you remember who it is? No. I don't it's, remember. Uh, <laughs> she says he ran Spain. He ran Spain. And okay. He ran Spain. He ran the country, and it was the 1960s, and then he died. Oh, right. It's Franco. Oh, right. She, Franco. She Jesus. dated Franco, right? <laughs> and in the movie, it's like played as something like kind of funny and. Oh like, wow! Yeah, That's exactly. Great. Like, oh, Franco, General Franco. Who's that? You know, whatever. And then she goes. Um, for a date with her boyfriend, Greg Kinnear, who they've been trying to paint as this like horrible guy throughout the film or just like totally not right for her. And the whole yeah. time I'm thinking, this guy's all right. Like he's a bit self-obsessed, all right, fine. But I like him, I'd go for a pint with this guy, <laughs> as people like to say about politicians. Um, and then they straight after that scene where she finds out he, she dated Franco, she explains this to Greg Kinnear as they go into the cinema. And he's like, oh my God, she's talking about Franco because she hasn't even worked it out who it is yet. He's like, that's disgusting, that's awful. How could she do that? And she was like, well, you know, people do strange things when they go abroad and go on a holiday. And it's like, yeah, like buy a bad hat, not, you know, date a dictator. And she's like, oh, it doesn't matter. And then they sit down in the cinema and he's like, look, I can't do this relationship if, if I'm with someone who doesn't take politics as seriously as me. And then she's like, you know what? I didn't vote in the last elections. And then she breaks up with him or they break up with each other. And I was like, but, she's, but she's the hero there. Yeah, but she's the hero. Exactly. Oh, by the way, sorry, spoilers for um, <laughs> <laughs> you've got mail like for the wow. middle of the film. But the yeah, main I, thing was I like, remember. Wow. 
the main thing I remember is that the beginning credits of the film feature this song that I sometimes get in my head about like going around with your dog and how you shouldn't go anywhere without your dog. And you do- and it's kind of weird because it's got nothing to do with the film. Like it kind of would set up a film that's about Tom Hanks. It's like Turner and Hooch or something. Yeah. That makes sense. But Spiritual it kind of sequel. doesn't relate to anything. Anyway, does he even have a dog in it? I think Hanks has a dog in it, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I think yeah. that's a sign that he's like a good man because he's got a dog. Yeah, exactly. I also, yeah, yeah. I also remember that he quotes The Godfather a lot in it or something. Yeah, it's quite yeah. weird. The film has a thing about like, a stereotype of men being obsessed men, with the Godfather. Men quote the Godfather, do they? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's meant to be like really funny and like an original yeah. thought or something. Do they, Nora? Do they? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it wasn't great. And then, yeah, the next day we watched um, My Best Friend's Wedding. Have you seen that? Yes, I think so, but I have no memory of it. That not one even, I liked more, not right? even the opening credits music. I don't remember. The opening thing. credits. And that's really funny you just said that because when you mentioned the opening credits to yeah. um, You've Got Mail, I was like instantly like, yes, I want to talk about the opening credits to um, My Best Friend's Wedding because it's one of those scenes that has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the film. It's just like um, some like 50s-esque looking women doing a, a song and dance, like almost like a David Lynchy and like over the top, like ode to marriage and like a woman finding a man and then settling down and that being you know what um makes them happy and is their like kind of lot in life but it's so overdone but also so beautifully choreographed everything i was like oh we're in for a treat here this is going to be interesting no it's mostly just like your average kind of rom-com with some weird stuff in it at one point um the best the main character's best friend that's not the best friend that she's fallen in love with um they're at a dinner and he just starts singing a song, but like he's just singing it, it's not a musical. And then slowly everyone starts joining in with him, but really, really slowly until and suddenly it is a musical. And the whole scene is like completely like everyone's coming out dancing and joining in. It was like Mamma Mia, but for just one scene. <laughs> it, really, really surreal. And there's a few other little moments like that in the film and I really enjoyed it. So well, I like wedding. All right, actually. <laughs> what I like about it is that it's directed by PJ Hogan, whose previous film to this was Muriel's Wedding. So oh, yeah, obviously yeah. there oh, that was makes this a big, lot of sense. So there was this mm. big breakout hit Australian film. The guy goes to Hollywood and then people are like, okay, baby, we'll like your ideas, but we really want some of that wedding feeling. We got this wedding movie for you right here. You know what I mean? It's just so yeah. you just like type putting someone in a box, just being like, Oh, and the film is totally that. Well, but kind of in a good way, because you can see like, OK, he took the gig, you know, or was forced into the gig or however you want to phrase it. But he could not constrain himself because there are several scenes like that throughout the movie that are like, oh, this is weird and interesting. How did he get away with that? Um, and the ending as well is quite like different and brave. And it kind of makes the movie. If the ending went in a different way, you'd be like, oh, that was that was disappointingly predictable. Um, but it makes so much sense that he did Muriel's writing. I didn't even bother to check it out. But yeah. Because that's quite an odd, you know, idiosyncratic mm. movie as well. But anyway, enough about the rom-coms I watched uh, a week ago. <laughs> I think we should, uh, <laughs> how yeah. disparaging was that? The rom-coms I watched a week ago. <laughs> Let's move on to uh, the bigger picture. Rob, do you want to tell the beautiful people at home uh, what yeah, we're talking about? Certainly. So this this week, this month, whatever it is that we do this podcast, <laughs> uh, we are uh, we're going to discuss review aggregator sites. So uh, Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, are there any others? Those are the ones, right? Those are the yeah, two. Yeah, that's that the big ones. About. Um, and, uh, and the kind of the um, the disproportionate weight they seem to have right now in a lot of film discourse, uh, whether or not that's valid, whether or not these things are good, bad, having a harmful effect, great, whatever, uh, is what we're going to be discussing. So um, with that very, very elegant, introduction uh do you want to kick us off dennis what's your what's your because i know for example you do use the metacritic list as a guide for for which films to to kind of pick up on don't you like on, yeah i was gonna say that, um that was pretty well introduced and um this is all a bit inside baseball but i find it fascinating and uh, i hope the, the listeners at home do too but yeah let's go deep uh just straight in on the personal i think that's a good way to kind of kick us off actually so yeah um I really like Metacritic. I understand its limitations, and it's obviously not the only factor that makes me decide whether I watch a film or not. But definitely, if I'm looking forward to a film, I'm also looking forward to see what the Metacritic score is going to be. Um, and this is an arbitrary number, but it's true more or less. Like if it has less than 75 or less than 70, 
I'm like, nah, I probably won't watch it then. Unless like I, you know, read us some other review that's like, oh, don't listen to the majority. Actually, this is, you know, a lot different, more different than you think. Or for example, if I can tell it's a movie that was controversial for its subject matter or its level of violence or something, and that's why you know the weighted review's gone down a lot, then I'll check it out. Or it's cultural reasons why people don't like it, or po political reasons, mm. or vice versa as well. Um, then I'll still check it out. Um, but yeah, in general, I, I, my tastes tend to align. Over the years, I've realized my tastes tend to align with the critics. And that if, if most critics thought that it was like a 50 or a 5 out of 10, I probably will as well. And so unless it looks incredibly interesting to me or it's about something I really care about, I'm not going to bother. Because, um, yeah, I'd just rather watch something that I think is going to be really good. Um, so that's kind mm. of how I approach it. Um, but how about yourself? I uh, I don't do that <laughs> because mm. uh, partly as well because I am sometimes out of step with critical opinion and there are films that I really love that got badly reviewed and things like that. Like, you know, I can think of films like Seek Your Friend for the End of the World or... Uh, I was Josie literally about to mention or, that. <laughs> or, or, or Josie and the Pussycats or something. I'd be mm. like, well, if I went on the strength of reviews when it came out, it wouldn't be one of my, like, treasured films. Uh, also, like, going back... Um, I remember, for example, 2001 a Space Odyssey famously got quite mixed reviews. There were some really scathing critics at the time. Mm. I imagine if that was around now, that would probably have a middling. It actually has a very high Metacritic score. But if you look at it, it's all modern reviews. Going, yeah. It remains a classic, you know, all yeah. this kind of thing. If you had it at the time, contemporaneously, it would probably be rocking some kind of 50. And people would be talking about how it was some kind of failure based yeah. on the, the way people talk about these things so i'm dubious about that as well because i don't think it gives much room for things that have been overlooked and will be reevaluated and things like that but i understand why because as i understand it you use it as a guide for sort of films you otherwise might not have picked up on that wouldn't have caught your eye that you know are worth watching right and i guess it's a good measure for that yeah, like the, and, for example, the indie films that rise to the top on it, you're kind of like because yeah. I think for, for most of the mainstream Hollywood stuff, if it's a director you really like or something you've already heard of or you're invested in, the Metacritic score presumably is not going to have that much of an impact. But it's picking out those things and thinking, well, I wasn't even necessarily aware of this, and then it comes a bit, a bit your... of both, to be honest, because I do I do go on there. They have a good list of like the highest rated film of every year. So I, mm. you know, every couple of weeks or something, I'll go on that and I'll see, oh, what's the new films that are on the top hundred for for this year, and be like, oh, I never heard of that film. Um, but I do tend to keep up with a lot of trades and press and stuff. So in general, I know what stuff's coming out, and I, like I say, I'm more anticipating what the score is going to be mm. than I am like seeing the score and going, oh, I should check that out based on the score. And actually, right. if it is a film I've been looking forward to, and the score is like forty, I just won't watch it, and unless right. like. It's David Lynch, or it's uh, the trailer really, 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 really engaged me, or some other like you know aspect that really pulls me in. If mm. everyone says it's crap, I'm not going to watch it probably. And of course, like you've alluded to, that means that occasionally I'll miss out on something that I really would have enjoyed, or maybe in years to come will be reevaluated. But I've found that, that tends to be one out of ten times. So. I'm well, unhappy with that ratio. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah. I'm unhappy with that ratio. Uh, and I think it depends how you watch movies as well, because I think we talked about this a bit before. Like, I tend to watch less movies, but when I do, it's more like a sit-down ritual, like, this is the movie time. Um, so as I don't spend so much time watching them, I want to make sure that it's going to be of a certain quality, probably, mm. you know, based on what, what the critics are saying. So Yeah, I mean, full, full disclosure, uh, like, I I do that for, like, good movies right? <laughs> and then if i was if i was gonna put on like chaos walking for example chaos walking would be on while i'm working in the week in the background yeah. with me kind of paying half attention uh and that's how i watch a lot of the like netflix original movies and stuff like that like for example you'll notice i've logged like uh, P.S. I love you. P.S. I still love you. P.S. I love you for more. Or whatever. Like all those films. Those are not films I'm watching in the way you describe watching. Films. Hang on. Those hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I <laughs> sat down as appointment viewing to watch the first one. I was like, yeah, people yeah. are saying this is fine. really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, the first they're one fine. I really liked. Yeah, they're all, yeah, they're all they're all they're they're good. They're charming. But I'm not going to sit down and turn the lights out and say Shh, to my wife and and <laughs> and, and pa pause it when I need to go to get a glass of water. Like I'm not going to do that with that film. You know, maybe fair, that makes fair. me some sort of snob. But I'm going to have that on in the background, and I'm going to be on my versa. laptop, and I'm going to be browsing stuff on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'm gonna no, but also vice versa. Like if I'm saying that to like a movie that is not so you know, 
it doesn't matter if you miss two minutes, probably, you know, PS, I love you. Mm. Um, then maybe I'm the snob for like being like, shh, we need to pause it, quiet, pay attention. It's PS, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a movie, chill out. <laughs> yeah no so, i guess yeah. i guess the thing is is that you like um this is kind of a bit of a tangent shock shock horror for this podcast but i guess as well it's like uh how that if you watch a lot of movies you know they can't they can't all have or maybe they can for you but for me they can't all have that kind of um they can't all command that sort of attention or that dominating sort of place in my life. You know what I mean? Like there are, yeah. uh, to, because I try to watch quite a lot and I try to keep up to date. I don't have the hours in the day to do that. And I guess yeah. your answer is, well, only watch the good stuff then and pay attention to it, which is completely fine and probably better. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I like to have, I like to have seen a spread. Like I yeah. always liked to have seen a spread. Of no, I, mean, we, I mean, the, the motto of the channel is, you know, that all films matter. And I, I kind of agree in your approach for that reason, because you see more of what is out there, what is in the zeitgeist. Maybe you didn't watch every single second of um, Army of the Dead, random example, um, mm. but you've seen that it. Is a back, so that is definitely a background watch. That'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's bloody two and a half hours long, so it better be yeah. a background watch. So I, I, logged, I logged Zack Snyder's Justice League, and I did not pay... Full attention for four hours, Dennis. Oh, four hours. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I was still interested yeah. in watching both of those. But yeah. um yeah, exactly. So I do like to occasionally check in, and that's again, that sounds so elitist, doesn't I it? Check in with what the people are watching. But I, um, I think as well though, you, I think as well though, certainly if you're trying to be any sort of critic as I once was trying to be, um, or I guess technically as we are on here, but like if you're trying to be any kind of critic, I think you kind of need to know what the shit is as well, because yeah. otherwise you get a kind of distorted view of what quality is. Because yeah. you can watch, I don't know, maybe the latest A24 horror film comes out that's well regarded or whatever, and you watch it and go, well, it's kind of average you're like well is hmm. it average yeah like, is that yeah, average yeah, because yeah, i yeah. watch average <laughs> like average <laughs> is lower than that <laughs> like, this is Definitely. above average yeah. uh, so i think i think it's good to kind of keep the perspective as well maybe on that but uh, but uh, but you know this is this is the view of somebody whose main passion and hobby obviously is film like i'm not expecting anybody else who's kind of you know most people watch two or three films a year at the cinema if that and they don't really take it that seriously. So I, I'm aware as well that this kind of academic approach to just wanting to kind of see things is yeah. not really not yeah. really the norm. You know? No, totally. And there's so many things about a bad film or an adverse film that you and I mm. might think, oh, that's incredibly interesting because why did they do that? And then that's such a weird yeah. choice. And what a mistake that was. Or not even only bad things, you know, like interesting, like good, happy mistakes or, you know, odd ball director choices like I was talking about with my best friend's wedding most people aren't going to care about that but um yeah so I think actually we talked a bit about the personal let's maybe talk about the the macro a bit more um so well, I'll say, I'll, go on. I was just gonna say on the personal because I didn't really talk too much about my relationship with aggregators there in, in, just in the sense that um I like it I, I like more Metacritic than Rotten Tomato for reasons we'll discuss when we talk about how they work but like I I like them as a context thing like I like them mm. as a historical context thing I don't find it that valuable to see that um uh 2001 a Space Odyssey now has 80 whatever it is or whatever on there because that's obviously new critics but I think as these things have a legacy and they're old and that's just the old data it'll be interesting when a thing's re-evaluated in the future to look at its Rotten Tomato score and go oh wow that thing was actually a rotten and it had 47% what was that all about in the same way that I used to find when I was first getting into film it's interesting to have a Halliwell's guide because you'd look at it and you'd kind of just get a temperature on stuff because they were all like or one of those variety books because you get the snippet of the contemporaneous review so you'd look in the Halliwell's of the variety and you'd see like a really sniffy review of the exorcist and then you'd have you'd be able to measure that alongside the kind of current acclaim and cultural impact that the film has yeah just interesting to have that context so i think they can provide an interesting context as part of the discussion yep. Yeah, and like you say, especially as time goes on, these two platforms are going to be really interesting for that. Maybe in 10 years' time, The Woman in the Window will be considered like a forgotten classic. You never know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that's actually quite a good uh, place to start where you kind of mentioned the difference between these, these two websites. So rudimentary way of explaining it 
is because, and we're explaining it in this way because a lot of people don't seem to actually know the difference or exactly in the case of Rotten Tomatoes, exactly what it is demonstrating to you. Um, so at the risk of sounding a bit pedantic and also patronizing, here we go. So Metacritic uh, takes a film review and either the film review had a score, like seven out of 10 or something, and then puts it in that scale of zero to 10. Or maybe it's just a subjective written piece and they work out roughly what they would imagine the score to be based on what someone's written. So again, now that was a four out of 10, right? Collects all of those and gives you the average number. I don't know if it's the median or the mean. I failed maths at school, had to retake it so I could go to university. So <laughs> I don't know. Do you know which one it is? Because I've got no idea. No, I, I also failed maths, which you've hey! you know, well. We're in that club together. <laughs> Solidarity. Love it. Yeah. Um, and so that's how Metacritic works, right? Rotten Tomatoes is used to also have that number, right, by the way. Uh, and then they got rid of it, which really pissed me off. They hid it. So it wasn't there really obviously next to the uh, rotten and fresh tomato thing. And then after they got they hid it, they just completely eradicated it a few months ago and I've stopped using the website entirely. Um, but anyway, so the way Rotten Tomatoes works is if you're the review, the individual review gets six out of 10 or higher, it's called fresh, right? mm -hmm. meaning good. And if it gets five or less, it's rotten, okay? And then the number you see is all the reviews and how many got fresh and rotten. Um, and so a film that has 100% fresh means 100% of critics thought that it was at least a six out of 10 or mm. you know, at least good. And a rotten film is with 0%, for example, a movie could have 0%. That doesn't mean that every crit critic thought it was a zero out of 10 movie just means they thought that it was at least a five out of 10 or at most a five out of 10 and vice versa. A hundred percent movie on Rotten Tomatoes doesn't mean the best movie ever. Just means that everyone thought it was good, you know, go see it. Sure. Why not? So for me, that's incredibly misleading. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that that's actually what the number means. Um, and also it just really feeds into this binary pass fail good, mm. bad thing that we have a problem with as a society, I think, at the moment. You know, this is kind of polarised, you know, left, right, good, bad, <coughs> woke, racist thing going on. Um, but it's also obviously exaggerated, exager no, can't even say it. Exacerbated. Exacerbated, thank you very much. Um, and exaggerated by the internet um, and the kind of the culture that's, that's there. So that's kind of my feelings on the two and the differences between them and maybe why Rotten Tomatoes is a bit shit. What do you what do you say? I uh yeah, I, I don't care that Rotten Tomatoes mm. uses that metric. I think it's also interesting to see if you look at if you look at the fact that Metacritic also exists and does the other thing, then Rotten Tomatoes gives you this kind of pass fail grade and was something seen as good or something seen as bad. And that could obviously have a like you say, a kind of a harmful effect on the discourse because a lot of people don't really understand how that scores being made but as a sort of glossary at a glance was this well received or was this poorly received uh, fine i think i think the differences between our opinions to some extent is that i i don't really care mm, <laughs> about yeah. it. so yeah, i don't yeah, really yeah. care what the score is it's not going to influence me in any way and i don't really care what most critics thought of anything so i it, it kind of to me it just still has that like um, I don't mean this as like Distance. a, uh, a yeah, but, but also, and I don't say this is like a value judgment. I mean, it just literally, it also just has kind of, it's only an intellectual interest to have in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, there is yeah, no yeah. part of me that has like a vested interest in it. I don't care about it in a particular way. Seeing that a thing is like, you know, seeing that Paddington is 100% fresh, I'm just sort of like, oh, that's cool. You know, I don't care. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and the Metacritic one might be more like accurate, but it's like, I, I also don't see, and I say this as someone who gives numbered scores on Letterboxd, right? But I also don't actually see the value of assigning an arbitrary number to a piece of art. Like, it's a very strange thing that happens with movies and video games that would be completely weird if you came out of an opera and did that. It would be yeah. fucking insane if you walk around the Tate Modern going, that's a six. Yeah. Oh, that's a yeah. that's a four. Oh, that's a yeah, ten. Yeah, yeah, Must yeah, see. Yeah. It's so it's such a weird way to talk about art. It's such such an arbitrary sort of thing. And also that number will change any given day. Like some of my favorite films, like you know maybe there'd be a four one day and a five another day or, or whatever. You know you know at five. Um, so I do find that very. I find basically I find it hard to get upset about it being done wrong 
because I already see it as being extremely yeah. arbitrary. So yeah, then yeah, being yeah. annoyed about someone doing this very like... yeah. So then someone doing this very arbitrary thing in another arbitrarily stupid way that's equally stupid to the other <laughs> stupid way, as far as I can see it. It's just like fill your fucking boots, mate. You know what I mean? I just and so I find both numbers. I find both numbers interesting, but academically, and I think they're interesting as a cultural kind of context thing. And in a way, it's probably better that the Ron Tomatoes one is different from the metric one because they both exist so you can see both and kind of get and the Rotten Tomatoes one means overall was this scene good bad and the Metacritic one is slightly more of a deep dive and they they both exist and they both complement each other in a way I suppose so I mean the, so the, the harmful aspect I think as we'll come on to talk about I think is more in the way these things are being used rather than how they exist because as as they exist they don't have a negative or positive they're not inherently good or bad in, in existing it's kind of the way the data is then used and feeds into the culture that becomes strange yeah i mean you could say that about any technology kind to an extent but i think yeah. it's a bit weird this concept of like uh kind of like you say like we'll take art or whatever and then we'll try to objectify it to some extent in terms of ratings and then if you're a prospective viewer of something you won't go okay what did people think you'll just go no uh did it did everyone say it was all right and then you go, oh yeah, everyone said it was all right, so I'll watch it then. It's like, but that is, but that is in the whole, isn't it? That's the issue. That's the issue. The issue yeah, is how yeah, the data yeah. received. It's like, um, I don't know. This is this is a real rabbit hole. And I'll try not to go too deep down it. It's like the concept of cultural appropriation, right? Cultural appropriation is a is is not a value judgment. Cultural appropriation is a term that exists in academia. Right. And then it gets taken and it gets run with. By the way, if you're listening, like I'm not here to say cultural appropriation doesn't exist or any of that. Like I'm not on that. By the way, I'm not on that side of the aisle, but I'm just <laughs> saying that cultural appropriation as a factor then comes out of a kind of an academic context. And then, like a lot of things that come out of an academic context, gets adapted without any nuance into a mainstream context and then gets run away with and becomes its own different thing that, 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 that no longer had any control over right like yeah. like the like like um uh you know he's, he's he's made the dinosaurs now and they're free and you can't you can't you can't you can't unmake the dinosaurs Hammond right and the thing is because of uh, in a way these technologies or these these kind of sites are a little bit like that because the thing is it's just in a kind of academic context there is nothing good or bad about saying by the way the majority of these critics thought this thing was fine that's not yeah. bad or good. That has no, no of course not. at all. Yeah, it's yeah. when that gets it's run just with presenting data. Take it out of context and then use it to justify some some other end that the data maybe doesn't even support or it's it's not nuanced enough. I think it's the death of nuance in general that's the issue. And I yeah, think it's the desire to use these before. things. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's the desire to use these things in a certain way rather than the things themselves. Because Rotten Tomato isn't part of a a cabal <laughs> you know and you get but it gets written about like it's uh you know you see um you shared one of these kind of comments with me last night talking about it, actually was you see that comment a lot about how rotten tomato has been paid by disney to pretend marvel movies are good or something it's like that's not what it is that's not what's going on here they, yeah yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, well, to go back to something you were saying before as well because i completely agree like the, you know to a certain extent this whole objectification of subjectivity is kind of stupid and pointless and when we come to review aggregators it's even more stupid because it's like turning a subject a subjective opinion uh which gave a number to a subjective thing and then turning that into a number itself do you know what I mean? Like it's like mm. layers upon layers upon layers of turning something subjective into the strange, the strange abstraction. Yeah, trying to make this yeah. very subjective thing as objective as possible. Trying to put maths onto it, um, and I can see, I can see why it's interesting um, to industry people because they want to do that mm. anyway. They give everything a score. They want to see. That's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Is this has an audience score of this, and you know we're aiming for this and that. Uh, and I don't know if this happens in movies, but the way it does in video games, but. I know there's some controversy about things like Metacritic because of the way that video game developers will um, actually give up bonuses based on the eventual Metacritic score, uh, which makes it even more like problematic because you might come and review a game from the point of view of um, 
just didn't resonate with me. I don't like that type of game. I mm -hmm. thought politically, I didn't like being an American soldier in Iraq, right? Mm -hmm. And the game developer doesn't get their bonus for making just a technically <laughs> polished game that they were supposed to make, right? Yeah, or so you break very, the, the 100 yeah. score. You break the 100 one... and the... And the fans yeah. get annoyed with you because exactly. they attack their thing and ruin the score. And 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 I feel like there's and I don't have any um, research to back this up, but just being aware on the internet over the last twenty years, I feel like uh, what's happened is it started with the video games that people got really precious about these scores. Like that, that became a thing. Things got review bombed when people were angry with them. Uh, game critics started being sort of threatened and harassed when they didn't give the latest Sony AAA title a 10 out of 10. And they go, you've brought the Metacritic score down, you bastards. You know, you're so biased against Sony or whatever, right? That happened in video games. And then the video game nerds started doing it with Star Wars and Marvel and DC. And it's kind of gone into film where it just yeah. never existed before. It just wasn't a thing, right? Like, I think if you were in the 70s or the 80s or whatever, and you read a Empire magazine or a, or a, the Daily Telegraph or whatever, and you saw that a film you really liked had a three, your rage about that would begin and end with you seeing At the breakfast it table and just yeah. going, oh, they didn't get aliens, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, that'd be yeah. it. That'd be it. Yeah. But now it's yeah. the whole industry of outrage, and there'll be a... There are some YouTube channels where every single video that they'll release a daily four hour video and they've got 50 of them. And they're all about how Brie Larson's feminist agenda has ruined movies or something. Yeah. And and I feel like Rotten Tomatoes it has been kind of taken into that sphere. And those people sort of police it in some way, take it very seriously. Yeah, completely. I think Rotten Tomatoes is a great example as well, because um, I was doing a bit of research into Rotten Tomatoes and I was like, I think my Google search was Rotten Tomatoes. Um, is bad for cinema, question mark, just trying to find a good, you know, opinion piece to get some ideas from. And, you know, you get that thing that says, people also ask. And the top, <laughs> yeah, you know where this is going. Is Rotten Tomatoes was, biased? Is Rotten yes. Tomatoes owned by Disney? Literally, quote, why is Rotten Tomatoes <laughs> so biased? And then you go into one of those Kiora, I'm not sure you pronounce that website, but yeah. you know the one I mean, um, yeah. pages. Uh, and it says, yeah, so someone says, yes, of course it's biased. Proof of this is a rating I just looked up. I won't name the show, but it received 100% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 2.7 on IMDb, dot, 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 ellipsis. Now, if that doesn't show bias, I don't know what does. <laughs> so I think one of the problems we have here is, a, is a, a simple problem of semantics, right? What is bias? What does bias mean? What did Rotten Tomatoes set itself up to do? Let's make this clear. Rotten Tomatoes does not review movies. Rotten Tomatoes does not pick and choose like which reviews it wants to put on there. It just gets all the most popular reviews, gives you an average score, okay? The difference between the critic score and the user score, yeah, it could be different. Is that a bias? I don't think so. Check out this other quote I found on the same page, right? <laughs> Some former Rotten Tomato visitors have a set. Oh, no, not this one. Sorry. Uh, oh, did I lose it? I might have lost it. Yeah. But anyway, basically, there's someone else um, saying yeah. that, of course, Rotten Tomatoes is biased because they give more weight to critics than they do user scores. And I was they're like, two but that's two separate scores, mate. Well, and also, that's the point of the website. The point of the website is to show you what critics thought en masse, right? It has a user score too because they know people like that and mm. it's another feature of the website. But the main point of the website existing is to show you what critics thought in general of a film. So yeah. how is that biased when it's the objective of the website? People drive me insane. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also, kind of like, every single review of a piece of art ever is going to be biased. Like it's going to yeah, be biased yeah, yeah, yeah. because you're coming in with your own biases, which often you are reviews, blind to. Though. But that's the reviews. Yeah. That's not but the site is. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, no, but I understand that. But the reason I bring it up is because these people are the same people a lot of the time. And it, again, this happened with the video games that's come into film who demand this like quote unquote objectivity with every review that is an impossible standard to achieve. And yeah. your objectivity and their objectivity are going to be two entirely different things anyway. So it's, it's, it, it does feel like it's a certain type of person that is the person kind of really misusing this website in a certain way. This is a little bit of a tangent as well, but I also think yeah. it's absolute bullshit. It's a bit like when people say they want free speech and then all of a sudden they're shutting you down uh, when you talk about things they don't like, uh, which happens all the time. Um, because they'll say, oh, we don't put politics in your reviews. But then if the politics in the review align with their politics, which mm. tends to be right-wing politics, sorry, uh, then they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's fine. 
they'll hand wave that away, you know. But they didn't just mention the graphics. That's what you said you wanted. They mentioned that this character was black and, you know, it was like um, forced wokefulness or, uh, you know, what's they call um, posturing? Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so they're hypocrites as well on, on top of that. <laughs> I think, but I think like taking it out of the realm of the um, Brie Larson ruined my Star Wars type people, right? They, <laughs> take it away from that side of the conversation to slightly more normal people in quotes. Um, the the frustrating way I see Rotten Tomatoes in particular employed, Metacritic doesn't seem to get brought up as often as Rotten Tomatoes. I think Rotten Tomatoes just must be much more popular. But I Rotten so. Tomatoes tends to get used by, if you're on Reddit or YouTube comments or Twitter, or any of these places, um, and you say uh, that you don't like a particular film or you like a particular film, the response you're going to get from someone a lot of the time now is, well, it has a 97 on, on Rotten Tomatoes, so it is a good film. You know, um, and I've had that yeah. With all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I've had that with all kinds of stuff on Reddit. I remember point saying at one point, I don't like the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies because I don't like the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies. I think they suck. Come at me, right? I don't like them, never gonna like them, right? And I made a comment about that at some point, and I can understand a response that says, Well, I do like them, and here's why I like them, and here's why they mean something to me, and that's actually good, and that's like good, like discourse right mm -hmm. a, a response that just says well collectively they grossed this much at the box office and it has a rotten tomato score of 97 so you're wrong it's just like that is not even film discussion that's not criticism that's not art that's not talking about art that's nothing yeah that's nothing it's just throwing that, numbers that at a wall me. and seeing what sticks that's yeah. and that's the part that annoys me like i don't have any problem with these things just existing and i think they're interesting places to reference and to look at and as you say like you can use metacritic to sort of give you a steer on what's worth diving into and watching more but to use it as definitive proof of something yeah that's it's ridiculous. like it's just insane i just don't it, get that at all it's it's sad at the end of the day if you if your <laughs> intellectual capacity to argue begins and ends at it made this many numbers and people said this many numbers then you know it's not even worth getting into it with them, really. Um, yeah. not, not to attack individuals, just the general but attitude. I, I think as well, though, and I'm guilty of this, like I'm bad at this myself because I can be quite lazy, but like the thing is as well is these sites can also replace the reviews. They're not supposed to mm. replace the reviews. They're supposed yeah. to be a kind of overall collative sort of guide, and then they link to the reviews, and you can click read more, and you can find out what the review said. But to be honest, show of hands, how many people are actually then going and reading all the individual reviews? Because yeah, I would exactly. imagine it's not many, right? Yeah. Like I, I am looking in there, I'm seeing the pull quote maybe, and I'm not going, well, what did uh, Tim Roby say? I'm not doing that. I just see yeah. the pull quote and the, the number. And how uh, many and that's, people that's actually that. look at the pull quote as well? Like that's yeah, another well, layer, right? That's <laughs> another layer deep. That's like that's if you're a real that's if you're a real intellectual as you go down to the pool quote. Um and so but yeah, it is it, that, that aspect is problematic. And I understand where that comes from because like to talk about video games again, I am one of those idiots who um if I'm looking at a video game review, I will just scroll down past all the text and just go to the number. Like I've done that loads of times in my life, just gone, okay, is this yeah. worth my time? Scroll down. Eight out of ten. That's game review speak for four out of ten. So, <laughs> so and I'm not that, bother. that is so true, by the way, because I think we yeah. did talk about this a couple of weeks ago. But on Metacritic, it's kind of astounding, right? Because they have four categories, don't they? Movies, games, television, and music. Now, mm. for everything that isn't games, there feels like a real sliding scale. Yeah, and you might see something in the top five, which is kind of how they represent it. Now, the top five like most popular yeah. things out that week or whatever the most buzzed about releases. Often you might have something in, in the 90s or then down to something as low as the 30s, right? In that top five. If you look at the games, it goes from 90 to 80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. always. <laughs> it's insane. It's, it's crazy. Uh, and you just go, uh, well, can't trust them then. Like, it's, it's interesting as well, right? Because you mentioned music there. And it's interesting because growing up, like in the 80s and 90s, if you had said which medium, like which art mm. form, medium, whatever you want to do, is the most tribalistic, 
it would have hands down been music. Yeah, because definitely. music was how everyone associated their kind of cliques at school and mm -hmm. we buy Kerrang magazine and we're into <laughs> Q and we like, you know, but that was kind of the groups, the, the, the <clears throat> yeah. particular types of music, particular types of clothes, all to go back to mods and rockers, you know, music was the place where people got angry with each other. And it's strange because like, like you say, in music, the criticism isn't something being read by these kinds of fans, I guess, in general. And it's still going to kind of be on that sliding gradient where there's like a two out of 10 and a whatever. Um, and I, I guess people don't rage about it. But I'm sure if I got in the weeds and I read the reviews for oh, a yeah. play album, I'm sure I'd find some diehards like getting angry about it. For sure. But it does seem to have lost that place in the culture as being like the main um, kind of outward display of your identity, right? Like, it mm -hmm, seems mm -hmm. that now being into Marvel movies or DC movies or being into PlayStation or whatever is more of a, an indicator of who you are as a person, maybe. But I don't know. I'm not a kid. So maybe kids are kind of listening to this game like, no, it's still music, mate. But, God knows. I mean, in the, in the playground, maybe. But when it comes to, I don't know. Yeah, it's tricky. We'd have to. I think, uh, I think the playground now is just people that like Zack Snyder's Superman and people <laughs> that like Marvel. And that's, that's, the, that's the fights. That's all the fights. Maybe, people that maybe. Star Wars is SJW propaganda now. Uh, and people <laughs> that don't. But it's it's it is odd because these things didn't used to be very tribal. Like I don't remember no. at school um, ever there ever being any sort of tribalism around movies. It wasn't a thing. Like there was no never, video there games. A, obviously, you had like Nintendo versus Nintendo Sega. Sega and stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, and obviously with the music and stuff like that, definitely. Yeah. But yeah. With movies, no. Everyone went to see Godzilla, then everyone went to see Titanic, and everyone said yeah. they were all good, and then that was it. <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> and, 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 I think... and went, yeah, all right. <laughs> But that's a, that's a good point you kind of accidentally made there about everyone went to see Godzilla, everyone went to see Titanic, everyone said they were good, is that that's why the audience score is consistently high on almost everything. Because yeah. the thing is, is in general, audiences who've elected to watch something and then paid their money to watch it um, are more likely to come out either going, that was all right, or that was really good. Very rarely, I think, are people coming out hating what they've just chosen to go and watch. Whereas yeah. critics have to go watch everything. So obviously, they're <laughs> going to see stuff they don't like. Yeah, that's why there's but, this bias, right, between the two scores. Well, and also I think because um, general audiences tend to go like, what is it, two or three times, or maybe even less, like once mm. or twice to the cinema, and they're probably going to go see something that's quite big and a spectacle, and it's going to deliver on those things like nine times out of ten. How often is it that you go to see a blockbuster and um, you didn't get enough explosions, or you didn't get enough sweeping shots of you know beautiful people falling in love? Those things are pretty much a given normally. You know, so you're probably going to get what you paid for and you're probably going to walk away satisfied, I think, when it comes to, you know, your blockbusters, which is what most people will go and see at the cinema. Um, so I think that contributes to it as well. But yeah, What's but going I to bring up? Go on. Yeah, but I was just going to reiterate, like, I think that critics are being forced, I say lightly, because it's not yeah. really a hardship, but they're forced to go watch everything that comes out by and large. So the thing yeah. is, is they, you know... John, Johnny audience member chose to go see Endgame. The critic from The Guardian didn't choose to go see Endgame. <laughs> That's going to yeah. be a massive difference in the score. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, you could tell Commode was not particularly excited about seeing Endgame. I don't know if you've seen his reviews. <laughs> I watched them again recently. I don't know why. Um, for both Infinity War and Endgame. And he's like, look, I know these movies see like really lots of disclaimers and being really careful about what he says. You know, like I know these mean a lot to a lot of people, but I just didn't really get it that much. I thought it was over long, blah, 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 blah. Um, poor guy, just clearly really afraid of backlash. <laughs> anyway, um, one other thing that bothers me about these websites as well is kind of the... Um, just kind of by their nature, the overly English language um, country, which really ends up meaning United States, kind of um, tunnel vision that they kind of have. Because sometimes I watch a film or I'm interested in knowing more about a film and it's foreign or not just foreign language, but like from a country that no one's ever heard of or, you know, is not really known for its international cinema and you can't find any reviews on there for it or maybe you can find two so there's not enough for them to aggregate a score or something and obviously i know what you're probably going to say which is who cares because <laughs> it's not that important but for someone who enjoys these kind of websites and helps me a bit um uh, i do find it a bit frustrating and also i think that you know that it does contribute perhaps negatively again to this kind of like tunnel vision we have when it comes to mm. english language American films all the time. Da, 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 da. So that's another thing where I kind of raise an eyebrow at the existence of them. They probably want to keep a lot of that stuff out for the same reason that 
um, the Oscars probably shouldn't be going as um, as Nomadland direction as it's going, which is the fact that general audiences see that and just see it as snobbery and just see it as like, well, who cares about all this? So then they'll search the top films on Metacritic or on Tomatoes and they'll see it's this Nigerian film that came out and then go like, well, I'm not going to use that website anymore because it doesn't actually show films that I would want to go watch. And it's it, I, that's particularly interesting with the Oscars because we look at all the Oscar nominations and we still see them as the kind of generally mid-tier safe Oscar fair that they are. <laughs> but to people in the general public who are tuning out of the oscars in droves yeah they see it as like the oscars is just this like elitist cavalcade of these miserable movies no one would ever want to watch you know yeah so yeah. it's uh, and I we're think like those maybe, are the safe one guys yeah exactly and i think i think there's an element of that maybe with stuff like ron tomatoes where it's like i'm sure the actual reason they don't include these things is more to do with staff and stuff like that because the thing is as well um presumably it's not an algorithm picking out the pull quotes and stuff. Maybe it is. Yeah. Maybe they've got that going on. But presumably someone has to go and find a pull quote and put it all up and do all of that stuff. Uh, and I can't imagine they've got people really that they're paying to go and do that for like smaller things that no one necessarily is going to yeah, exactly. be on the radar. No, listen, but, it's, a, it's, a, it's a website from the United States and yeah. the United States, for better or worse, is the leader in cinematic entertainment. So it makes sense. I'm just saying it's a shame and it's, you know, another example of how these films get sidelined, mm. etc. And just a bit annoying for me personally as a user. Um, yeah. What you were talking about with those lists definitely happens on Metacritic, by the way. Um, that Bosnian film, um, about the woman who's kind of stuck in the in, in the middle of the conflict. Um, I can't remember how to pronounce it. I'm sorry, um, but it was like I think it was nominated for the best picture um, in the Academy Awards for best international feature or whatever they call it these days. Um, difficult film, foreign language, odd film. That's number one in the Metacritic top 100 for 2020. Wow, okay. So there's a perfect example of like people maybe going, oh, well, I'm not going to use that then because who even knows? I can't even read that title, <laughs> let alone have I heard of it or do I want to watch it? So, yeah, you've probably got a point there. <laughs> yeah, and I think Rotten Tomatoes out of the two definitely does skew more mainstream, doesn't it? But, yeah, um, but yeah so so kind of in terms of the, the kind of bottom line on these things and whether or not they're valuable, whether or not we like them, I mean, I think it's quite clear, but just to reiterate, like, I, I think they're interesting. I think they're an interesting tool. I don't like when someone uses them to try and win an argument because I think that's stupid. And I think they do to some extent because of that dumbed down a lot of film discourse. But then I guess you could also say that the people using that as part of the film discourse were probably not going to be having ele elevated film discourse anyway, right? So, it's, you know, who yeah. cares? Uh, yeah. But that's kind of where I stand on them. I don't put a lot of personal weight on them. Um, and I don't think that uh, there's a cut for me. There's not a cut off point below. This is not worth my attention personally for me. Um, but how about you? What's your, what's your overall closing yeah. statement, Dennis? <laughs> Just kind of what I said at the beginning that, um, yeah. yeah, we're kind of not opposites on this one, but we're coming out from different sides of the aisle. I would say that I do uh, quite like Metacritic. One of the things we didn't really have time to mention as well is that I, I kind of like watching how a review mutates over time as well. Mm. Like when the, the pre-release reviews come in and you see like, you know, super high 90s and then the actual film gets released um, and people who didn't get invited to see it beforehand get a chance to see it and you see the score go down a bit, that, not too much, but a bit. That happened quite a lot with Lady Bird, didn't it? I remember Lady Bird was like 100% or something. I think Lady when Lady Bird came out, it was like, wow, this film's 100% and it's now topped Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes or whatever. And then obviously the more waves of reviews come out and it dampens yeah. it down. Yeah, which is interesting. And sometimes it can happen a little bit in reverse and, you know, whatever. And um, also, I had an interesting um, example recently. Have you heard of The Underground Railroad, the, the TV show? No, I haven't. Sam, the new... Um, project by Barry Jenkins, director of Moonlight, and if Bill Street could talk, um, and it's an adaptation of a book, and it's like a mini-series. Um, so not full-on film, but, you know, somewhere in between there, that classic problem we're having, well, not problem, phenomenon we're having a lot <laughs> at the moment. And I was really excited for it, um, and got an episode and a half in, and we both just kind of looked at each other and said, nah, this isn't for us, for various reasons. Um, but kind of... And then we looked at the scores and I'd already seen the scores on Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes and they're super high. They're like 91. Good catch. Um, <laughs> they're like super high and like everyone's just, you know, 
piling on praise upon praise upon praise. And we're just sitting there going, why? I don't get it. Like, I'm going to go and look at all the individual reviews to find out what it was or to see if anyone noticed the mm. same problems that we had with it. But it can also have the opposite effect where you kind of feel a bit isolated and like, you know, logically, like, I shouldn't think like that. Everyone's entitled to their own opinions. I know what I'm talking about, etc., cetera, et cetera. But it's subconsciously, it still gets to you a little bit. It's like, it, I mean, like that's... a little loner in the corner. Like, yeah. I mean, that, that's exactly goes back to what I was saying at the beginning there about um, my fortnightly film, because that's my experience. You know, I'm working down the canonical thousand greatest films of all time. And then, yeah, you come across something, like I said this morning, Carl Theodor Dreher's Audet, two, two hour plus film of Danish people in a very austere room having deep conversations about God. Uh, and you watch it and go, I, I didn't really super get or enjoy that or see why it was great. But it's like yeah, the 35th yeah. best film of all time, apparently, guys. Uh, and, and you do feel there is a slight disconnect with that. And it does make you kind of go, do I just, should I just stop watching film now? I don't think I get it. I don't <laughs> think I get it. Like, that's it. I, think I, I think I should quit this. Um, Maybe I've been it, a poster the whole time. But it does, yeah. like, it does, it does kind of have that impact sometimes. And 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 also on that subject, like um the list that I'm working from that I have decided to use as a guide for it to watch is as fucking subjective and stupid as you using Metacritic. So there's yeah. no, <laughs> there's no, like there's nothing for me here sort of saying like, Oh, you use that score to you because I'm, I'm working off the back of what a load of just predominantly old white people think about like the great films of the past and making myself watch three hour long silent movies because they're at number 20 on the list so you know who's the bigger asshole here <laughs> you decide as, as usual as we usually say rob probably both of us yeah. <laughs> okay well i think that wraps us our, our chat up about um our review aggregators so we would normally do like a top three um at this point in the show but we thought we'd go for something a little bit different today rob do you want to tell them yeah what we're no, do? it's it's very loose it's just the fact that i was watching um some of our viewers, listeners, probably aware of the Criterion Closet. Have you? Do you ever watch the Criterion Closet videos? I used to, and then you? I just kind of yeah. stopped. Yeah. yeah, well, they're very self-indulgent. They're kind of, yeah. they're kind of, basically, mostly rich people. Some of them, I'm sure, aren't rich people, but mostly very rich, very privileged people get let in a room full of really nice, expensive DVDs, and they get to just fill a big bag up and take them all home. Uh, yeah. And 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 in doing so, they also get to congratulate themselves on how smart they are and tell you kind of about their great taste. And I say that as if it's a terrible thing, while fully aware of the fact that if I was one of those people, I would absolutely love to do the Criterion Club. Yeah, exactly. Um, you so wouldn't I, say I, no, I would you? No, I wouldn't say no. Um, although, if you've seen Mike Lee's one, he's such a fucking socialist ledge. He doesn't take anything, and he just really? kind of walks around. He doesn't take anything. He just takes things out, talks about why he likes them, and puts them back. Right? <sighs> what a legend. Anyway, yes. though, there's a couple who do that. And actually, Alec Baldwin, shout out to Alec Baldwin, oh. he... Um, Everything he takes, he's taking for a friend. So he'll take stuff out and go, oh. Oh, well, I'm working with this guy on this film. He loves this guy. I'm going to give him this as a present. So so that's good. If you're going to take stuff, uh, take it for somebody else as a present. Redistribute the wealth. Yeah, the rich world. people. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, right. Moving on from that tangent. I watched, um, I watched one with uh, Alexander Payne which uh, made me realise the, the exact type of person I never want to actually be, but which I probably am tending towards, where he's very, very sort of, um, he's just very precious and very, uh, very kind of, I don't know. Uh, but there's a bit where He's very Alexander Payne about everything. Uh, and um, I, watched, I watched him in the Criterion Closet, and there's a bit where he picked up Kurosawa's high and low, and he t turns it to the camera and he says, you know, this is probably sacrilege, but... Uh, I think this is actually Kurosawa's best film. And I realized at that point that um, not only was that really annoying and a really obvious opinion that he just gave, because that's kind of the hipster opinion on Kurosawa these days is that High and Low is the best film, but that I also share that opinion and I am that guy. And I realized that um, there's actually a kind of second canon that's been mm. formed, isn't there, where you get like... Um, you know, there's the 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 mainstream choice of Pulp Fiction, but there's the hipster favorite of Jackie Brown. There's yeah. the mainstream choice of 2001: A Space Odyssey. There's the hipster favorite of Barry Lyndon. But by the way, I'm guilty on both those counts as well. Those are my favorites. 
Uh, there is, um, you get that with Magnificent Ambersons. People always say that's Wells' best film, not Citizen Kane. Um, you know, you get this with a lot of these films. So I was just kind of really based on that, putting out there and wanting to talk to you about this this hidden canon, basically, that apparently exists. Yeah, I've just thought of Among another one, knobs. actually. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's another one that's gaining traction lately as well, which is Sorcerer, William Friedkin's uh, remake of Sorcerer. It's like his hidden best film that no one knows oh, you've, about. It's like... you've, just, you've just reminded me of one um, because uh, Ridley Scott, the hipster choice for Ridley Scott is always the duelists. I think the reason I think the reason you have to go as deep as the duelist or Ridley Scott is that the conventional wisdom of Ridley Scott is three films, isn't it? It's it's Aliens, Blade, it's Alien, Blade Runner, and Thelma and Louise are like his canonical three. I thought films. you were going to say Gladiator. That's no. interesting. <laughs> no. People love that movie. Some people do, but it's yeah, not. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think it's uh, the canonical top three Scots. Maybe not. I might be not wrong. Kino Land. Wrong. Not in Kino. Yeah. Land. Yeah, uh, critic-wise, I because, suppose it is Thelma Louise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so because those are like the three, I think rather than say, I think saying any one of them marks you out as a a, a basic bitch, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think yeah. I think the duelists, the duelists is the one. People um, always like to go to bat for Kingdom of Heaven as well, don't they? Like, well, actually, I, if you've seen the director's cut, but that that I tell you what, that's that's a niche within a niche here because that is the hipster favorite. That is the hipster favorite for if someone tells you they like Gladiator best. That's the yeah, 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 yeah. That's, so that's, you're, true, you're that's right. true. So that's somebody says, so if somebody <laughs> says their favorite Ridley Scott film is Alien. You say you're a fan of the Duelists, but if somebody yeah. says it's Gladiator, you point out that Kingdom of Heaven is actually the superior film. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's it. And I, and was, I do I... prefer Kingdom of Heaven. To <laughs> I think terrible, I did as well, tour. actually, to be fair. Yeah. In that, that only, only, the extended, case... only the extended director's cut, though, Dennis. Of course. Not the, not of the course. Butcher's theatrical Is version. there another cut? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I in, in, my, in my house, it doesn't exist. In fact, my, exactly. children, my children don't know there is another cut of Kingdom of Heaven. <laughs> 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 they would be out on their asses if they mentioned it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of racking my brain um, for uh, examples where I kind of um, fall into this one as well. And it turns out that I'm a bit of a basic bitch because I can't really think <laughs> of many. Um, I know they exist and I um, could think of examples. The only one for me possibly is like the one Francis Ford Coppola film, and I haven't seen all of them, um, but of the big ones that I have seen, the one that affected me most and I enjoyed the most personally, like I would say was my favourite, it's probably The Conversation. And that's definitely mm. a hipster choice. Um, yeah. because it's it's regard well regarded but no one's going to choose it you know no it's, one. i i yeah no i completely agree that's a really good pick because the conversation is the one that you kind of get shown at film school these days and it's the it's the it's it it 100 percent. the conversation is the is the coppola one uh and i think because because of the fact that the conversation is now i would argue the the kind of canon best couple of film or is getting there um i think rumblefish is making a, a ah, yeah, steady run of, because because this is the thing i discovered as well in the course of thinking about this is that there is the established classic which is citizen kane seven samurai right then you've got the classic hipster uh, favorite which is magnificent amberson's high and low and then You've got the counter backlash new hipster favorite coming up, which in Orson Welles, which in Orson Welles' case is F for fake, probably. Yeah, that's F the for one fake everyone is F about. At the moment, And yeah. in in um, Kurosawa's case, that's Redbeard, because I'm starting mm. to see people putting Redbeard really high up on their lists. And I've seen I've seen all of Kurosawa's films. Redbeard ain't, <laughs> ain't in the top five. So it's it's uh, so the thing is is that like there's de there is definitely like a um, a new new canon for yeah me. <laughs> of course because all i mean not all it is and i'm not saying everyone who says like this particular film is genuinely my favorite is part of this but in a broader sense it is just kind of like a race to see who's the more obscure and cool right like it is i'm not i'm not saying you're doing that right or anyone else in particular but yeah <laughs> i mean we're all guilty of that to an extent right like me too like I always talk about, oh, yeah, I saw this uh, black and white Iranian film last week, Rob. Did you hear of it? You know? So, yeah. <laughs> and you know the wrong. answers, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like, why did you ask, you arsehole? Um, 
<laughs> so we're all guilty of it to an extent, but I think that's totally what it is on a you know a sociological level, isn't it? So of course there has to be another ring to the to the circle, and then another one, and another one. So you run out of yeah. movies, and then Do you're you on to like, oh, but have you seen his short film that he made when he was a student? You know, that's actually the masterpiece. But the whole the whole like um, ascension of Vertigo to the top of the film canon is a relatively modern phenomena, which I think is born out of this hipster, but well, actually. Mm tendency right like vertigo is a really good film not saying a word against vertigo but vertigo's ascent kind of came as a it was it was a flop compared i think compared to other hitchcock films and it wasn't critically yeah, well regarded well. at the time it came yeah. out compared to a lot of hitchcock films mm -hmm. and i think classically if you're talking about the best hitchcock films i correct me if i'm wrong i'm not the biggest hitchcock fan i would have imagined psycho would probably be the canon like most significant hitchcock movie it's not my favorite hitchcock movie but i would imagine uh or, or real window maybe i don't know but it's yeah it wasn't, the, it wasn't vertigo anyway it definitely wasn't vertigo yeah and vertigo sort of ascended like a phoenix of critical reappraisal <laughs> right up to challenge <laughs> citizen kane um and uh so so it happens it happens even at the kind of canon formation level where you get these things coming mm. up and and then and then pe subsequent generations you know like the, uh, the next generation will say that the rules of the game was not actually um you know renoir's best film and it's yeah. you know the other one so i mean thank god in a sense right because i yeah. remember growing up and you just see citizen kane citizen kane citizen kane citizen kane again and again and again and again you know and you just go god what is this, is that going to change at some point like, like are we going to collectively decide that Citizen Kane maybe sometimes depending on some people wasn't the best movie ever and so in a way it's a good thing like you know that ch taste change or trends change i suppose um it's kind of but in a into the concept yeah, I think even this kind of hipster formation of the canon is a good thing in a way, because if you separate it from the people who are disappearing up their own asshole and enjoying the smell of their own farts, like me, uh, and you just put it out there into a more general audience, if the, the hipster word gets out that uh, High and Low is the best Kurosawa film, then that means more people that then watch High yeah. and Low. And obviously by that mm. time, the hipsters have moved on and they've gentrified yeah, a new yeah. area and that's not the cool coffee shop anymore. They're not in High and Low anymore. That's gone. Yeah. That's dead yeah. now. Uh, yeah. But but that's reached the mainstream consciousness. So I guess that a lot of picking these things out does filter through eventually i was gonna say filter down but that seems like a terrible ooh, snobby ooh. Bloody joke, like, don't mean. <laughs> i mean but filter through right yeah, yeah where yeah. where where these things happen if enough people start saying magnificent ambersons is actually awesome world's best film then even if it isn't better than citizen kane it probably does mean more people will watch magnificent ambersons and that's yeah. good magnificent ambersons yeah. is also good so it's it's not a bad thing is it ultimately no no i completely agree um, I think that's probably a good place to leave it as well. But yeah, it was, it was nice to do a little extra mini discussion, a mini, a mini, uh, a mini picture. Oh, oh yes, we might have something there. We might have something there. Picture in picture. Ooh, <laughs> frame within a frame. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Well, uh, you have to let us know uh, your thoughts on review aggregators, um, and obviously the films you mentioned in Fortnite film. And what is your favourite Spielberg film? Is it? The Colour Purple, or is it E.T.? <laughs> um, and anything else we mentioned today, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Rob, do you want to sign off with anything before we go? No, that's uh, that's all from me, really. I've got my other podcast doing. My friend Craig has been a guest on this show uh, called Kurosawa Cast. We have just done High and Low, actually, uh, which is, you know, <laughs> sacrilege, but it might, it might be Kurosawa's best film. Uh, but uh, we just covered High and Low. We're doing Redbeard next. Uh, we're on a <laughs> chronological sweep uh and we are uh, we only have i think eight films seven or eight films to go i think so uh nearly what are you gonna three. do what are you gonna do when you finish <laughs> i don't know <laughs> probably just gonna retire from all the theodore dryer that i've had to watch <laughs> <laughs> fantastic all right yeah definitely check out rob's other podcast uh Curacao cast and we'll see you soon bye bye